Good day, everybody. Welcome to the latest episode of The Green F Show. Um, today we're going to be talking about the question of democracy in Australia, especially in relation to the, um, the question of the Republic reposed by the, uh, the death of um, Queen Elizabeth and some of the issues related to that. Before we get underway, I do want to acknowledge that we are recording this show on Solon Aboriginal land. Today we're both here in Gadigal country, uh, but we acknowledge that this is uh, land that was never ceded uh, sovereignty was never ceded and we pay respect to elders um, past and present. Also, before we get underway, I'd like to uh, just let you know that if the best way you can support our work is to become a Green Left supporter. And um, that's plan start from just $5 a month. You can find out more in the link below or look on the Green Left website. As I said, today we're going to be discussing the question of democracy in Australia. And I'm here with Peter Boyle, who is a long-time leading member of the Socialist Alliance in Australia. Uh, and we're going to be discussing the question of radical democracy. But I guess just to, just to begin, Peter, perhaps can you discuss with us this massively overblown um, coverage of, of Queen Elizabeth's death and, death and the accession of um, uh, Prince Charles to the, to the kingdom? Uh, can, you, can you please discuss what that means? Yeah, I think most people are starting to appreciate how over the top the, this, this sort of wall-to-wall -wall coverage has been. And, you know, perhaps it was to be expected from the corporate media, but to see the, the, the ABC, which is you know, considered to be, you know, a public broadcaster and, you know, a, a lot of people of liberal and democratic opinion have, have looked to the ABC's coverage, you know, for some sort of rational alternative to, to, to Murdoch and, and the rest of the corporate media to see the ABC, you know, almost go into overdrive uh, over over the royal family uh, is was was I think shocked a few people, um, and you got the sense that um, you know they were pushing this 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 line that you know, now is not the time to talk about anything else, let alone the question of you know breaking our ties with the monarchy, becoming a republic. But just as it was absolutely the correct time to talk about climate change when there was the bushfire crisis, when there was the floods, it's the right time now to talk not only about breaking our ties with this feudal remnant, the British monarchy, but also to talk about the state of Australian dem democracy and how we can move forward. So people have pointed out that the, you know, the, the succession of, of King Charles was very quick and that this basically gave people no time to sort of think about whether any, were there any other options, um, etc. And this is, I think, in slight contrast to the gentle suggestion, even from a number of establishment figures, is that, well, perhaps once Queen Elizabeth dies, that would be the appropriate time for Australia to become a, um, a republic. But now uh, it's like full steam ahead on the, on the monarchy propaganda trail. Um, so I guess what I... You know, I, I think it's probably pretty obvious, most progressive people would think it's pretty obvious that Australia should become a republic. But, you know, is that enough? And what, you know, what, uh, what else can we say about democracy in Australia? Well, OK, first of all, let, let's, let's think about why. Why, you know, from, from a position where, where, which was quite commonly held, uh, I guess from the Republican side, but also for the people who were perhaps in the middle of the debate in Australia, you know, you know out of deference, for some strange reason, got to wait till uh, Queen Elizabeth dies, and then we can talk about it again. Uh, the fact that uh, you know we now see this discussion being pushed away, uh, I think, reflects different times that we are living in today. Uh, this whole question of the monarchy, the the, the adulation of uh, the monarchy, ties in with something quite reactionary happening in our society, and that is the drive to war. Because what this is doing here is it is encouraging all the most conservative sentiments, uh, support not only for the establishment in the broadest sense, but also support for our permanent allies, Britain and the United States. So I see a connection, a real political connection, and this is the context of what we're going through now, between the drive to uh, prepare for war, you know, ostensibly it's against any challenge to democracy, so to speak, but really it's a preparation for war against China. War against China because China economically uh, is progressing to the point where it's starting to challenge the still existing 
economic and political and military hegemony of Australia's longtime partners, the United States and, and Britain. So I think there is a connection here. Now what's insidious, I think, is that uh, they have managed to use, uh, to, 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 to get, uh, you know, otherwise people who are known as liberal journalists to, to engage in so much self-censorship. It, it is a bit shocking to see it, in my opinion. I've, I've watched a few interviews uh, on, on ABC and I've been surprised. It's almost like they were, you know, they were, they, they, they were arguing from, from, from monarchist talking points. Uh, and trying to shut people down, etc., etc. But on reflection, I, I, I think we should not be so surprised because we have begun to see this around the discussion of the Australia-China relationship. There's been increasingly an acceptance of the basically the pro-imperialist alliance position as, as normal. There's been an acceptance that China has no right to, 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 for instance, increase its ties with uh, uh, Pacific Island nations. You know, as though this is, in, in the South Pacific at least, this is, this is Australia's backyard, hands off, you know. And if liberal uh, journalists or liberal or people, uh, progressively liberal journalists, are prepared to go and to bat for this idea, it, it, well, it's not surprising to me that they've sort of just, you know, gone along with this whole adulation. Um, so I think this, this is the actual context of what we are seeing today. I mean, to me, when I think about it, there are some very simple things that could be done in Australia to make the place more democratic um, that wouldn't even challenge, you know, the, you know, it's not even going beyond capitalism. Uh, simple things like proportional representation, like a Bill of Rights, uh, things like that would, they're, they're kind of like no-brainers. If you're, if, you're, if you're a genuine Democrat, uh, how can you sort of be opposed to them? Um, whereas we see like on both those sort of things and, and dem you know, democratic reform, in fact, the democratic reform, if anything, is going backwards. The last few decades, we've seen all the anti-terror laws come in. We've seen a whole lot of restrictions on democratic rights and free speech rather than, rather than expansion. So perhaps could you talk about the question of popular mobilisation in terms of how we won the existing democratic rights we've got and what that means for how we can, uh, you know, how we can advance democratic rights in the future. Yeah, I mean, you know, ev ev everything we have, every bit of democracy we have is a product of, you know, generations of struggle, you know, and as you say, uh, if anything, democratic rights are being taken back, you know, and, 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 and this has uh, been happening most spectacularly since the beginning of the official war War on terror, you know, this, you, you, we have been losing rights at, at an amazing speech, uh, speed, uh, including now the right to protest is extremely challenged by legislation brought in by uh, several state governments, labor state governments even. Uh, it's, uh, you, you can go to jail uh, not only for being part of a protest, but perhaps going along to cover that protest, you know. Uh, you could, it, it's incredible the things that they're getting away with now. So that's true. I think we have a real uh, issue of democracy. However, what, what is clear is that if the debate about Australia and the Republic actually does get to surface, and you know, it's possible that it will, um, because to some extent, I can see the cameras focusing on the new king. <laughs> he's, he's done some amazing bloopers, mostly connected with malfunctioning pens, but uh, there's something that's going to come true here, you know, and, and uh, a, a popular appetite to, 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 to look at this question, you know, could resurface fairly quickly. However, what is most concerning is that the prepared position of the Australian Republican movement, which is going to be the mainstream uh, argument uh, for a move to a republic, is extremely minimalist. What they want to do is basically flip over from a, a governor general to an elected head of state. Now, they've got a proposal which has been fine-tuned, in their opinion, it's been fine-tuned to, be, to get maximum support in, in, in uh, a referendum, uh, that does bring in a couple of uh, improvements on the current situation. Currently, the governor general has got you know, reserve powers 
which are only restricted by what's called conventions, not written down. And I think that the Republican movement wants to make this explicit. So in the situation where there is some sort of gridlock in Parliament, where there's some uh, challenge for the legitimacy of who should, who, who should uh, be Prime Minister, uh, the rules are laid out under their proposal. And I think that, to be fair, would be a small democratic step forward. And I think we could support it, and I think the left should support even that minimalist change for those two reasons. One, it makes more explicit uh, you know, the kind of behavior that's expected. Uh, and secondly, because you know, we just break this uh, largely symbolic tie with an institution which, you know, it's, it, it, it's uh, well, I'd say it's offensive to a lot of people. It's offensive, first of all, to First Nations people in this country. And actually, this now coincides, and I think it is actually this, it, it is part of the same discussion with the discussion around, uh, you know, First Nations voice, uh, voice to Parliament and the adequacy or inadequacy of that it completely collides. So I think that's, um, that's, that, 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 that's a very, very important, uh, very important point there. So breaking with a monarchy has got some value, but I think it's largely symbolic. But when I, was, when I was thinking about the minimalist proposal for change, it, it struck me that we have to ask the question, you know, even if we have a non-royalist uh, or monarchy related head of state uh, what is the function of this head of state and then when you think about it and you look at their arguments for it you realize what they're trying to put forward is you know we want to have a head of state that has uh, that is accepted more by the community that is more representative you know of of, of the modern australian community a, a sort of a consensus building uniting figurehead. Now, is that a good thing? And I think we have to ask this difficult question because is it a good thing? Should we all be united somehow by some figurehead, head of state, when in actual fact we live in a society which is not united? It's divided sharply by conflicting interests, by powerful, rich uh, people and corporations that are actually now the real major decision makers in our society who are preventing us from addressing uh, the climate emergency, for instance, you know, who are, you know, have got investments in coal and oil and gas that they want to protect. You have them on one hand and you have the other people on the other hand. You have people who want to, uh, who, who, who want the governments, whether labor or liberal, to continue to give tax cuts for the rich while you know, cutting back on social services that are urgently needed. Uh, you know, this is the conflict of interest in our society, and it can't be papered over, you know, even if you have an uh, elected head of state. So when we want to talk about real democracy, I think we have to have a critical view of the state. This thing called a state, which pretends to float above all the class interests in society, is a fiction. It's a convenient fiction for the real ruling powers uh, to, to sucker people in, to saying, oh yes, we all have the same common interests, the Australian interest. But what is the Australian interest? When you look at a question like uh, climate change, is there one interest or is there more than one interest? The so-called Australian interest, we're all supposed to come behind every single drive to war, which has been a drive to support other imperialist allies in a war against another country, from Vietnam, or Korea, Vietnam, Malaysia, to Iraq, to Afghanistan. That's always been the case. So there, there's a conflict of interest. Um, so we are, I think we're, we, we, we should have an interest in challenging this. And any real democratic momentum that we want to, uh, you know, if, we, if we're going to unleash a real democratic momentum, uh, has to start to address this. So you, you asked the question about you know, the power of mass mobilization. So first of all, I mean, just as in the past, every single democratic change that we have had, not just in this country, but all around the world has been one true 
real popular mass struggle. So if we're going to have democratic reform in this country, I cannot see it coming about without a mass movement in the streets campaigning for it. If it's simply left to these um, official Republicans, you're going to get token change. You know, you're going to get absolutely token change. It might be slightly better, but token change. Because, as you say, there are big questions that need to be discussed. Simply on the level of the representative system, there are huge inadequacies. Uh, we have uh, an electoral system on the federal level and on the state level which is fundamentally undemocratic. You only have, we only have proportional representation uh, in the upper house of reviews. Uh, the lower house, which forms government, you know, basically favors the two-party system. And the two-party system is completely bought out by powerful, wealthy interests, as you can tell from the, the list of donations that they get. And more importantly, from the way they behave when they actually come into government. <laughs> So there are reforms like that, you know, um, I, I think at the electoral level, you know, uh, the introduction of proportional representation right across the board uh, would be a great thing. In which case, you wouldn't need two houses of parliament. You could have one house of parliament, you know, which is uh, more representative of the people, and that would be a step forward. That having been said, I don't think that's the end of democracy. First of all, there's all those attacks on our democratic rights that have to be dealt with. And part of this actually is also addressing uh, the, the urgent need for not just a real settlement with First Nations people, but also a real addressing of the consequences of their dispossession uh, on this continent. That has to be dealt with. And, and, you know, already there's a good discussion about this. I think, uh, I think the Greens are leading it quite well. Lydia Thorpe is leading it quite well. She's saying, look, you know, uh, don't just give us a token voice which you can just ignore, you know, without dealing with the questions of treaty, without dealing with the questions of deaths in custody, all these things, you know, the gap which never seems to close, uh, despite numerous and numerous inquiries laying out what steps that could be done which are then consequently, uh, subsequently ignored. Uh, all that has to come into that. Um, so addressing all those attacks on democracy that we have suffered since, since uh, over the last few decades, uh, but also there's a new element. See, is it enough for us to have a situation where we have, we have, say, the right to speak, the right to vote, and then once in every three years we have an election, we elect these, these, these people, and then they run society? Is that the end of democracy? Uh, I, I think we say that it is not. There is a concept of participatory democracy which you know, we need to make popular and we need to try and, and, and implement. Uh, because we should not be just have a, a vote once a year and then be ignored uh, for the rest of the time. Because even in that representative election that we have once every three years, say we vote for you know, a Labour Party and it promises X, Y and Z and, and then does or does not deliver later on, you know, so what, what, what do the people do about that? Okay, we have demonstrations in the street, etc., etc. But should that be the end of it? Should we have more of a say than that? Now, one simple mechanism, for instance, which would be an interesting uh, uh, way to show this contradiction, would be supposing we, we, it, it was necessary before Australia committed itself to war to take it to the people and have a popular vote on the question. Well, I'll tell you what, what the figures show that all the last few wars, well, certainly from uh, the Iraq war, uh, they, they, they would have lost it. The majority would have said no. And the government of the day would be shown to be in total contradiction with the people. Currently, even though there's this amazing escalating, and you know, if you think the, the, the carry on in the media about about, about Queen Elizabeth's death, you know, it has been unending. Uh, you know, the whipping up of, 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 of war against China has been even longer, right? But despite that huge propaganda effort, according to a poll by, which is an ongoing poll, every six months I think they do it by essential research, a majority of people in Australia are still have the position that would, they would rather be neutral should there be a war between 
the US and China. And if you look at the younger people in the poll, you know, the, the majority gets even bigger. Now, sadly, over the last six months, the, that majority has shrunk a bit. So it shows that the propaganda is working, the war propaganda is working, and, and that's why they do it. Just, it just reminded me of one more thing, you know, the other thing which uh, it, was, uh, it was watching the whole sort of uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, media, ex you know, carry on, reminded me is that, well, this, this is also not accidental because actually the, the, the reign of Queen Elizabeth has been associated with a very concerted push, particularly in Britain, to, uh, to make the royal family popular. And, and that was actually, I think, is a post-World War II kind of campaign. And, you know, absolutely millions, perhaps billions of dollars have gone into this over the years. Um, had a political objective as well. You know, it, it, it uh, repaired the frayed social consensus, if you like, in the post-war years. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it comes to a bad thing in the end because now it's harnessed, you know, to back up... Uh, you know, not just, you know, uh, what do you call it, nostalgia for an old colonial past, but support for a current imperial uh, present. I think it's good to ask a simple question often with this kind of discussion. Do ordinary people in Australia have a meaningful say in what goes on in the country? And I think the answer to that is pretty clearly no. And you talked about war propaganda. I think that brings up the question of the media, especially the corporate media, which is largely owned and you know run in the interests of big billionaires and to my mind it's a no-brainer it's, it's or it's self-evident that you cannot have a meaningful democracy if people are systematically misinformed and the corporate media does nothing if not <laughs> systematically misinforming people about what's going on so i guess i wanted to ask you that question because i mean i think the, the corporate media is the sharpest end of it but really actually billionaire control of the economy in general it, it plays a similar role um is, there, is it not the case that to, to establish a meaningful democracy where people actually have a real control about what goes on, doesn't that have to go hand in glove with a broader challenge to billionaire control of the media in particular, but the economy more generally, and uh, therefore a broader social change project? Um, can you comment on that? Well, absolutely, of course. Um, I mean, actually, if you use the question, the media is a, the, is a good way of explaining it because... Um, you know, everybody understands the domination, say, of television, newspapers, etc., by Rupert Murdoch and a few other people, a few other billionaires. But uh, some people thought that uh, with, the, with the rise of, of uh, social media, that uh, this monopoly would start to be broken down. And to some extent, I think, it has been challenged. Uh, people are now no longer reading the newspapers. There's a whole generation don't watch television anymore. Uh, you know, they're going to online to get the information. But of course, power doesn't, you know, s stop at, at, at the old media. If you have lots of money, well, you can, as, as we have seen, you, you can put that money into Facebook, you can put that money into uh, YouTube, you can, you know, you can intervene with your wealth in these new platforms, and they are. And they are doing it actually in quite a... A scary way because they're not doing it in in the same way that they did it with the old mass media the old corporate media uh, and, and I think we, we see this in the rise of the far right and particularly far right propaganda and how it works hand in hand with things like Trumpism and 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 other far right uh, populist political leaders uh, they're going in the more they've gone into social media and I think it partly reflects uh, the, the the nature of the platforms like uh, like like Facebook and 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 and, and YouTube etc. Uh, they go in in a more sharper, pungent, more extremely right wing things in order to to switch opinion, um, and also in the process of polarization and trying up all sorts of wild, untested, uh, often conspiratorial type arguments. Uh, creates an atmosphere where quite a lot of people then get lost and they don't know, you know, and, 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 they, 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 and, and because they have money now and they can use their algorithms and what, whatever not to, to engage in these platforms in a manipulative 
a conscious manipulative way, uh, you know, th th they're finding that this is a better way of doing it. So, I ironically, uh, you know, the sharp end of right-wing propaganda has actually got bigger uh, since uh, the old media has been, you know, eroded in its influence uh, of, 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 over the masses. So, okay, that's a reflection of the economic uh, inequality, which is, I, I said before, is, is the fundamental divide in our society, but also uh, permanently undermines what democratic institutions you do have, you know, uh, and all this stuff about pork barreling and all that. I mean, it is, it is unbelievable how much of this stuff goes on. And there's so much of it, so much corruption and so much corruption in broad daylight that you have uh, premiers, uh, you know, if not prime ministers, trying to justify and saying, it's normal. What are you complaining about? You know, this is how we do stuff, you know? It, 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 it's like the, the owners of, of, of the big casinos, you know? Like, <laughs> money laundering. <laughs> it's business, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it, it is quite gross. So it, 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 I, I think it shows up there. Uh, you know, very powerfully. So it's true. In the end, you know, whatever democratic reform uh, we, we can win through mass struggle, uh, uh, going in the streets, fighting for it, it's, it's always going to be limited and permanently eroded if there's no economic democracy. So I think it's, it's it, perhaps we're getting to a point where we can talk about economic democracy and uh, political democracy together more easily today. Uh, so I was talking about, you know, like supposing we had a vote on going to war, uh, you know, what would happen? Supposing we had a vote on two propositions currently uh, that are in, in, in our national discussion. Should we give the tax cuts, the stage three tax cuts, which are overwhelmingly going to benefit the rich, and are going to cost, what's it, $240 billion or something. Uh, should we have that, or should we spend that money on addressing the housing crisis and climate change funds? Just use two, you know, I mean, there's a whole number of other urgent social issues. Should we spend $170 billion on nuclear-powered submarines that may or may not be delivered sometime in the future, uh, and will further, nevertheless, integrate us into the US military war machine and embroil us deeper into its drive for war against China, should we do that or spend that money on addressing uh, the climate emergency and urgent social need? If it was put to the vote, what would happen? You know, I, I think uh, most people in this country uh, would vote against wasting that amount of money and they, they would prefer to address uh, a um, to have it address, uh, you know, urgent social need and the climate emergency. The polls, you know, on numerous um, occasions have supported this idea that the majority of people actually would prefer, you know, the rational thing and the just thing to be done. But you never ever get a say. You know, you never ever actually get a say. You know, you just get a say in a poll, it's published in there, some people see it, some people don't. Uh, but we have a democratic system which uh, deliberately undermines that. So you mentioned um, Trumpism and this sort of far-right authoritarianism. I think that's actually, that, that is a real question in people's minds today, um, especially after the January 6th uh, insurrection in the United States. But there's actually similar challenges to even basic capitalist democracy in a number of countries in the world. Um, you know, I think, I mean, obviously the left can't be neutral to that. I mean, we're against those sort of challenges to capitalist democracy. But I think there is a certain tendency among some people, and even, I mean, I don't want to be sort of totally unfair, but even just the other day there was an interview with um, Samantha Ratnam from the Victorian Greens, and she was talking about the kind of the need to get people to have confidence in our institutions. And there's a lot of people talk about our democracy, and, and they use that as their way of uh, standing up to to this far-right authorian attacks on democracy. And to my mind, that's a bit of a, uh, like a shooting yourself in the foot kind of a strategy because our institutions, quote unquote, are actually so far removed from the 
uh, yeah, from the practical um, influence by ordinary people, um, that the left has got to put has got to push for a more radical democracy if we're going to actually, you know, maintain the popular support to do that. So, can you comment on this yeah, on this question of how do we deal with this far right challenge to democracy at the same time as pushing a vision for a a more meaningful, genuine, and I guess you know, the word is a socialist democracy. Yeah, well, I think it's, uh, it's pretty clear that we, there is a real challenge in the world. There is a rise of populist far-right uh, politics and in, in many countries. And, and I think it probably shocked a lot of people in the Western world, in particular, when they saw the Trump Phenomena in the U.S. After all, you know that's the <laughs> land of free, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, well, actually, more dangerously, it's 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 the model to which all our countries have been forced towards because of 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 neoliberalism. And and any thinking person is saying, well, God, if that's happening there, uh, you know, how far off, how many years off, you know, uh, are, are, are we for it in this country? Uh, but the answer to this is that we we can't just you know, out of fear for Trumpism, uh, go to supporting the old status quo. Well, first of all, Trumpism was partly created by the, by the sins and the failures of the old status quo. It, 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 is, it is crafted, in fact, precisely on the things that they did, because the old status quo delivered all the economic injustices, the, the endless wars overseas, um, you know, on top of, you know, ignoring the, 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 the climate emergency, you know, they created the situation uh, that we have today within which, you know, there is fertile ground for, for, for far-right, uh, you know, populism to, to develop. So first of all, you know, we have to recognize that there is a connection between this new scary far-right enemy and the old right-wing establishment whether it's uh, under the, you know, uh, under the, in the US, under a democratic government, or whether it's under a Republican government in Australia, whether it's under a coalition or a Labour government. That old establishment has got dirty hands when it comes to the developments that we are seeing in the, with the far right today. Um, secondly, I think we also have to recognise that when we engage in this, we don't just swing to a united front with the old status, uh, capitalist status quo, but rather fight our independent struggle to defend real dem democratic, uh, um, well, existing rights and to fight for new democratic rights. And we realize that this fight is aimed against both sides because one, you know, the old status quo, you know, started the, the, the bigger tax on it uh, and, you know, will, is quite prepared to continue them into the future. And we also recognize, as we discussed earlier, uh, their commitment to the same, uh, you know, uh, economic uh, 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 inequalities and the ruling class that, uh, that really runs society. They're loyal to those very same forces and are, are trying to implement this. Uh, and I, I think people can also see it happening, you know, in, in the sphere of international relations and, you know, the drive to, to, to war. Uh, because, so Trump's gone, Biden's in, uh, you know, the war drive continues. Absolutely. Uh, and, uh, you know, in, in many ways, the architecture of the current uh, wars in the world are actually designed under democratic uh, administrations in the United States, mm. um, they probably had a bigger say in its in, in, in its construction. You know, if you look back at it, Trump came in in the middle and you know he made a lot of noise, but actually didn't change very much. You know, all the uh, the U.S. international relationships basically stayed on a, a on the same course. Uh, if anything, he played uh, he functioned as uh, you know maybe to 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 whip up anti-Chinese sentiment in the most crudest and most racist way, including trying to blame COVID, you know, uh, on, on, on China, et cetera, and whipping up racism, you know. So, so I think that's basically, we, we, we cannot, whether we're talking about in general, in terms of, uh, you know, trying to defend democracy 
aside with the old uh, establishment, uh, nor can we do it on the level of, of international relationships and war. But furthermore, it is, you know, I, I don't think the ordinary people really have an interest in defending our institutions because they were never our institutions. These institutions were their institutions. But the, our institutions are very much still have to be built. And I think that, you know, it's a rich area of discussion. And, and many people in their daily uh, struggles are actually beginning to, 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 to reach out to elements of this. So I'll give you an example. Um, I'm very much involved at the level of local government. Uh, in, in camp many campaigns that we've been waging to try and uh, defend community interests against fundamentally a drive for privatization, the drive to, to, uh, you know, to, to, to restructure our communities so that they can make money out of uh, you know, quick, quickly built, shoddily built high-rise buildings or whether it's through building uh, privatized um, uh, tunnels and freeways and tollways uh, so that some rich company can, you know, all these battles that we've engaged in, uh, we have realized that uh, what we are talking about here is that we are trying to exert a form of uh, direct democracy at the very level that our community exists. And, and this has become a live discussion. So, you know, we are starting to talk about how do we get that democracy? See, because in reality, all the institutions that we have that supposedly uh, to, uh, you know, to allow us to engage democratically in society are actually they're, they're alien to us. They don't help us. And, 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 and this is why people, you know, this is why many people actually are turning away from politics. And as part of this turning away from politics is a big disillusionment uh, in the inadequate institutions. That, that are, you know, supposedly democratic institutions. People do not feel like they really have any say. Now, to address that feeling properly, it's not going to be enough to say, oh, well, let's just defend those old institutions. No, we're going to have to actually, uh, you know, we're going to have to address the real problem. If the community is going to have a say in society, the community has to have a say in society. And they, they ain't going to get it in the, uh, in, in the current institutions. So, at the local level, you know, we are fighting for things like, well, we want all the, uh, we want the councils uh, to be small enough so that, you know, communities can actually have a say in the day-to-day -day decisions of it that relate to their lives, uh, that their representation is not, you know, um, you know, so narrow that, uh, that, that it's not representation at, at, at all. They want uh, meetings of local councils to be open and there have been great experiments here, you know, largely coming from progressive struggles in the past uh, for open council, for instance, uh, in, the, in, in, the former, um, in the former local government area of Leichhardt. You know, uh, socialists actually pioneered this uh, decades ago, open council, and there's been a, a retreat from that. And we want to bring it back. Uh, we want to have the people in there, you know, watching these so-called representatives and holding them to account in real time. Uh, and then having a real say, being able to form our own committees to not just uh, have a say in the decision making about this or that project, but to have a say in the actual implementation. So we can be out there. And actually some of these bodies started to come together, whether they were volunteer organizations to, to develop community gardens or other such, you know, good things in, in, in the community, uh, you know, they, they act, tapped a kind of a a level of engagement and creativity that is out there in society that's still waiting to happen. This could happen right across the board. So I think when we think about democracy, we've got to think, you know, beyond defending the old democratic institutions and how can the ordinary people have a say, uh, not just once in three, three years, you know, electing a representative, how they have a say every day, whether it's by polling on all the key issues or whether it's through the construction of popular committees at the community level so that you can have a direct input into the implementation of policies that, 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 that are decided by elected representatives.
Thanks for that. I mean, there, were, uh, there was one other question I had, which in some ways we could possibly, I mean, in some ways we have already covered it indirectly, but it's, uh, it's something I've heard sometimes, I guess, from the more radical end of the spectrum that the word democracy is just so tarnished and connected to, uh, you know, to the capitalist elite that really, you know, really the word is, is, is not worth defending. But I okay, go, well, what's your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, there's an element in truth of this. I mean, democracy is a system to sort of uh, supposedly put the people uh, in control of this thing called the state. And the state is this apparatus, you know, which includes everything from the pointy end of police and soldiers to, you know, huge numbers of bureaucrats in various departments and the political structure and the parliaments and everything else. But it's an institution that historically grew uh, to serve one particular purpose, and that is to defend the rule uh, of an existing elite. So whether we're talking way back in, you know, uh, in ancient Greece or Rome, where the interests of big slave owners were being protected by, you know, an apparatus, including the, the soldiers, the centurions and everybody else, to the modern uh, democratic capitalist state, that, that, that institution still performs the same function. And as we discussed earlier, you know, a lot of the dressing of it is to pretend that this institution, you know, it sits above all these classes. And actually, it, it serves to protect the interests of one class and a minority class of that rich and powerful, uh, powerful people. So in one sense, it's true that really, you know, it's a bit of a, it, it's a bit of a sham thing, you know, like if you can say, oh, well, this institution is still going to continue to do what it's always done, but we're going to dress it up so that you think that you have, have control. But one question, which I, it was actually addressed very, I think, very clearly by, by the Russian revolutionary Lenin, you know, when he wrote uh, uh, his treatise about it about state and revolution. And he said, well, think about it, you know, we know what this is, this institution, the state, this apparatus to defend the interests of the ruling class and to keep it in power. We know what it is. And sure, we can say, let's get rid of it. Abolish the state. You know, it, it, it's a great slogan. Abolish the state, abolish democracy. You know, we'd be better off. But what does that mean in practice and how does it really happen? And he says, well, actually it happens uh, through the progressive development of real people's power. So unless you actually, we are able to grow this real, engaged, direct people's power institutions, you're never going to get rid of it. It's always going to be there. As long as there is a, you know, a, a powerful ruling elite, they are going to use their money to pay for people to defend their interests. So we have to build a democracy, uh, you know, if you like, a people's democracy or a democracy from below uh, before that state uh, can really be demolished. So you have two things, I think. You have, you know, you, you, could, you, could envisage, you can envisage this transformation purely in terms of a political struggle. So, you know, progressive majority forces eventually say enough is enough. We're going to get rid of the ruling class and we wage a political struggle on multiple fronts uh, and succeed in, in doing that. But in a certain way, you, you have to also build new institutions of popular power. And it is actually the process of building these new institutions of political power that in the end is what that uh, completely demolishes uh, and you know, uh, gets rid of the, the old state apparatus, the old democracy, the fake democracy of the past. So that the, the, the argument was that, you know, if you had the idea that somehow we would have this big fight, you know, uh, a revolutionary struggle, big mass demonstrations, people marching, and, you know, you'd, you'd knock off, uh, 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 push out of power, the old establishment, that, uh, you know, then you can just not worry about it. The, the, the state would disappear. Well, no, that's not true. Uh, you know, it, it, it actually disappears through quite a conscious process of empowerment of people and creating the new uh, uh, system of 
true democracy, a democracy based on you know, majority interests, but also on permanent engagement, not just you know, the limited democracy of representation. All right, thank you very much for that. I mean, I'd like to, yeah, especially thank Peter for taking the time with us today. Um, hopefully you found this Green Left show to be a, a, a engaging antidote to the uh, saturation, you know, pro-monarchy coverage on the, on, the, on the establishment TV. But also the Green Left show is, is about having the discussions that can help us to change this world. So hopefully that's uh, helped you in that as well. Um, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Uh, please remember, if you like the work that we do, uh, you can become a Green F supporter. The link is in the description. Uh, plans start from just $5 a month. You can also support us on Patreon. You can also uh, help build the audience for this show simply by giving a thumbs up on this video or, or this podcast. Help sharing this, um, uh, share this episode of the Green F show and we will see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.